and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from the From the Hilt channel. Developer of Lenharo Fantasy Adventures. I probably bit, I probably butchered the name. My apologies. And currently developing the military action game, amusingly abbreviated as Mag. Pretty sure that was, I don't know if that was intentional. The man better known as Logan. No Wolverine jokes. He's not Canadian enough for that. How you doing today, man? Not Canadian at all. <laughs> like I said. So, thank thank you for being open to come to coming into my temple and enjoying the insanity that happens around here. My pleasure. So, I will admit part of part of the reason I I wanted to bring you in is your background with GI Joe, which led to the creation of Military Action Game, uh, because. And I, th I think I told you about this before before we had set this up. I, we had both we had both came to pick on the um, various adaptations using the Essence Twenty system. And one of, the, for and for both of us, we had different reasons for it, but we were not fond of what resulted from that system. And. I had been I had been asked if I would tackle the GI Joe and Transformers one since I already did Power Rangers, but while I while I enjoy me some Joe, I am not going to call myself an expert. So I'm glad that you uh, had humored me in do, in doing this because well you're going to be more of an expert than me on this. Well, I've collected uh, the GI Joe action figures since '85 mm -hmm. and. Uh... The comics as well, and I basically guessing, read most of the material on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you started with the Marvel era. I did, uh, but yeah, I moved into the Image era, and then uh, you know the, the uh, Devils Do, but then back with Larry Hama with uh, the IDW. Yep. So now and, he's back. He's back to Image now. And probably probably suffered through watching GI Joe Extreme at one point. Uh, yeah, I, I watched a few of them. I wasn't uh, a big fan of that. Uh, that's 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 fine. Nobody was, and to this day, there <laughs> still hasn't been a DVD release of of any season of Extreme. I can't imagine well, this why. Is true. <laughs> they did have VHS. <laughs> Not that that mattered. I mean, the f full episodes are on YouTube, but it's going to be on VHS rips, so it's get so it's going to look like shit. Yeah, but. Even the devil eats flies, as the saying goes. <laughs> so, there, I'd like you to I'd like you to fact check me when it comes to when it comes to some of the early um, developments when it came to GI Joe. Okay. Um, now, before the version that before the version that we knew, um, the ori the original original was just was just a standard. Do Doll, where what would become what would become Hasbro was tr was trying to was trying to make um a bo a boy version of the success that they, that they had with Barbie. That's correct. In nineteen sixty four. Um. The other story the other story that I had heard was when was the soldier whose likeness was made into J. I. Joe had. Agreed had agreed to that likeness, but it had to. But the rule was, the doll had to be a U.S. Marine. I'm not familiar with that. I, I hadn't heard that before. Uh, they had actually one of each uh, military branch, so I'm, I'm not sure where that that particular yeah. uh, that that story comes from. When when you're doing these kind of research, it's there's a lot of myth and legend that goes about, so it so it becomes hard to parse some of that at times. Um, 
the I other get th- much more familiar with it when it became a real American hero in 1982. Yeah. Now, from what from what I recall, and you and again you can fact check me on this, because of some of the laws at the time, they decided to circumvent the promotion of the toy by not promoting the toy and instead promoting the comic. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, they couldn't put commercials on TV at the time. They changed those rules uh, fairly quickly after G.I. Joe started. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole idea of the comic book came about uh, by uh, meeting a, a chance meeting uh, with Jim Shooter, who was the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, and he suggested the whole idea of putting commercials on TV to advertise the comic, which in turn would advertise the figures. Mm-hmm. And they would around repl- the current the current rules. They would replicate this a few years later with Transformers, but wherever Marvel goes, drama follows. I know that there's a lot of drama with Marvel now, but this is nothing new. And nope. and we are talking the stupidest drama imaginable, like um, the, like the bankruptcy case managing to piss off a court judge, <laughs> thus violating the first rule of the court: don't piss off the judge. He was so angry with everybody that he declared that comic book sales could not be used to pay the lawyers. Oh, I, I, I hadn't heard that. I did know that Marvel had had did go bankrupt there for a while. Yeah, and the there's a there's. There's no, there's no one reason why the bankruptcy happened. It was a lot of factors. The speculator bubble going burst was one of them. Um, Ron Perelman's um, crack it, cracking of the whip to try and turn Marvel into a mini Disney. Yes, I know, but keep in mind this was the 80s when this when this went down. And the the chaos of the, the chaos that ended up happening when. Um, Carl Icahn, one of the most infamous corporate raiders of the 1980s, to the point where he has his own category. If you look up pictures of corporate raiders on Google Image Search, he was also the inspiration for the character Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. So make of that what you will. He was feuding with um, Ike Perlmutter, who who at the time was just the owner of Toy Biz. And it was more or less an ego thing because if it wasn't about Marvel, it was about the idea of not wanting to look, not wanting to look bad in front of what was it, what was at the time a small time toy company in New York. And it was to the point where T- Icon Toy Biz, the bank syndicate that was handling the debt, the judge and the trustee that the judge appointed to oversee the whole th- to, over- to oversee Marvel were all actively feuding to the point where there was open and naked hostility when they, when they were in court. <laughs> Pretty sure by that point, uh, Marvel had lost the contract for G.I. Joe, though. Yeah, I, I just wanted to bring that up to illustrate how stupid Marvel drama has always been. There, oh, yeah. I remember that there was one story of somebody trying to sabotage the G.I. Joe thing to try and get an Elric comic made. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. That uh, that apparently that apparently happened because somebody had some ideological issues about about Marvel doing a military comic. To huh. which I, to which I say that's kind of weird because because DC was doing one. It was called The Losers. Well, that wasn't the first uh, military Marvel comics. Uh, I mean, they had uh, Sergeant Ra- uh, uh, Sergeant Fury in the Howling Commandos back in the '60s and '70s. So. It wouldn't be their first crack at it. Yeah, I, br- I bring up the losers because that was around the same time. The losers actually turned they, they turned that into a pretty decent movie. <laughs> yes and no. But yeah. Yes and no. The that that movie wasn't based on the original losers, but rather the reboot that happened in the early two thousands. Right. And. It wasn't a bad movie. It's just, it's just that it had it had really bad timing because the A team the A team movie came out that same month, and the losers right. was made into a poor man's A team. Right. Yeah, that's true. So wasn't wasn't bad. Just really, really shit timing. Because obviously, when the act 
when an actual A team movie was was going to get made, that was going to just completely blow it out of the water, and it did. Well, a, 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 that's uh, that's true of a lot of movies. A lot of movies fall victim to timing. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, obviously, now obviously this obviously um this brings us to the. This bring this brings us to the whole thing with Essence Twenty. But before I get to that, there's one tradition I haven't um, adhered to, and that's going into the origin story. So, what was your first introduction to GI Joe? Was it the original film, or was it the was it the cartoon? Where where did you first get introduced? Well, that that would be uh, the, definitely the uh, original five part miniseries. Uh, mm. What they call uh, a real American hero now, but it was originally, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the original uh, uh, VHS was called it the Medicine of the Mass device. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they changed it when it went on to DVD. I don't know why they did that, but um, I started there, and I, you know, I liked GI Joe. And it was a neat concept, but I was an uh, avid collector of Star Wars at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I. I, I kind of got disillusioned by Star Wars, and I went through a series of, of, of collecting different types of figures until I hit on G.I. Joe, and I watched uh, the third miniseries of G.I. Joe, actually, at age five, when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And the whole the whole idea with uh, Shipwreck and Snake Eyes and the whole, the whole scene that they went through, that sold me on the whole G.I. Joe universe. And I started buying the comics and the figures, and it took off from there. Yeah, I can I can get that, and that I'd say that's as good. That's as the other the actually the other avenue when it comes to the origin story is the origin story with role playing. Since you are developing your own take on a Joe verse style RPG with military action game. True enough, that started around the same time. Uh, I actually, the first time I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons was in '82, uh, with the original uh, uh, the basic set, and I my first set ever was the Expert Rules because I, my friend had the basic, so I went and bought the Expert Rules, and then I moved away. So all I had for a long time was just the Expert Rules, and so I started with that, and I was pretty much. Stuck on regular D and D till about eighty eight, and then I started playing AD and D, and and that's you know eighty eighty second edition came out right after that, and I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the concepts I was always seeking uh, to add new things to the AD and D game, new classes, new races, and it, it when the third edition came out, that's really what I decided. Uh, everything I had. I had all these books for uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and they became useless, really. And I, I'm go I, I realized at that point that they were just going to do this every about five to ten years. They were going to make all the old books that they had useless, and it's 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 happened over and over again with uh, Dungeons and Dragons specifically, where about five every five to ten years they come out with a new edition, and it makes the old edition pretty much useless. So I I realized that with third edition, and I, I my wife and I just decided that we were going to make our own game, it's... and that led to the Linharo Fantasy Adventures. Mm -hmm. Because it, why change it, our campaign and everything over and over again? Like so, if if I I would have converted everything to third edition, I knew they were going to have a fourth edition within a decade. I, it's just inherent in the TSR company at the time, and then they sold to Wizards of the Coast, and they were even worse about it. So I was like, I, my wife and I together, we just designed the, the system of playing that we wanted to. And for a long time, we were content just playing with our homebrew game. But after a while, we were like, we need to put this into an actual game system and, and put it out. And that's where I started with that. And what led to G.I. Joe was I had my game uh, up and running. And just, just within the last couple of years, I've had it published. And when we saw the uh, the GI Joe role playing coming out, I was super excited. I was pumped, and I and I bought the the Renegade Games, the Renegade Studios version of it. And it was it was a it's a beautiful, nice book, well put together. Uh, the writing isn't bad, but 
And I'm looking at it, and I, I was reading through it. I read most of it. And I'm like, this game is, is just not G.I. Joe. And I was like, I have to do something about this. And then uh, another YouTuber uh, named Elfbait invited me on his, his uh, live stream to discuss the possibility of G.I. Joe RPGs along with Jason from Beckhead Studios. And over the course of that uh that uh, live stream we decided that there there should be a better gi joe role-playing game and afterwards a, of a lot of other people kept telling me we we need to we need to run this and finally i said all right fine i'll do it and it, i was kind of not really pushed into it that's the wrong word i was guided into what i think is is making what should be the gi joe game for Fans of the of the GI Joe genre, mm -hmm. the Joeverse as you called own, it, the Joeverse. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's where I'm at. That's mm -hmm. I I in the last two sessions for the military action game have been really good. There's a lot of uh, game mechanics I need to work out. Like I just in this uh, second session, I determined that the. Uh, in the Laurel Fantasy Adventures, we have something called Faith Points that adds a single uh, Faith Point to a die roll to alter a die roll one way or the other. And it, for the military action game, those action, uh, we I call them action points, and they seem to work out a lot better. So that's that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm still putting the game together, but it's, it's working, and it's working well so far. Mm -hmm. Now... Since we talked, since we talked about Essence, Essence Twenty, um, I do I do want to. There's a few things I do want to, di I do want to dive into, and some of the things I'd a I'd asked you about previously. So there might be some, re some retreading of gr of ground. Okay. So if we, if we, if I end up asking you something that I asked you, um, off off the off the record before beforehand, well. It is what it is. Okay. Um, no, no problem. Now, I have gone. I have gone through the S the Essence Twenty version, and I think one of the one of the fir one of the first things that I had that I had pointed out is the f is the fact that they do that it does essentially a class system in the form of roles. And some of the ex and I, some of the example characters for the for those ro for those roles, um, I think you I think you had a you had a few issues with. The... Um yeah, it, it, it just didn't seem like it was GI Joe. It was it wasn't it wasn't that it was not military. It just wasn't GI Joe. Mm -hmm. Oh. Like for in, like for instance, for the commando archetype, which is which is described as shadow operatives who specialize in infiltration, deception, and catching targets. The examples that they gave that they gave were snake eyes, tunnel rat, low light shooter, chuckles, and scarlet. They they got some of those right. <laughs> Did they get more right than wrong? Uh, I, I think it was about in the middle somewhere. Uh, Snake Eyes is definitely the G.I. Joe Commando. Scarlet, I would consider a commando. Possibly low light, but Tunnel Rat is your explosive expert. He's a, uh, he's an engineer. He's a combat engineer. So, you know, that, that where, where are, were these actual military specialties? That's what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. In, in in the origin part, they talk they talk about origin branches being army, navy, air force, um, non non branch specific, non military. But I don't think I don't. Th I think that I think the pr I think the problem that I have with that is if you even if you just use army, that's such a wide net to cast. Right. Uh I mean, well, there's over a hundred military occupational specialties in the army, so. And obviously, you couldn't put a hundred specialties in in any given book, so you do have to no. have to um, summarize. I mean, you could. It just 
you'd have a book that's <laughs> that's like 700 pages long in in just character creation alone. Well, like like with Marlon Harrow Fantasy Adventures, I decided to keep that simple, and I had ten basic archetypes and the little sub factions in those archetypes. Mm -hmm. Which is smart because some some pl because some players are going to ha are going to understand that co the concept of all those different occupations and some people are not going to have that kind of background when they're coming t when they're coming to the table. Right. What oh. really I what I really focused on was the specialties. Mm -hmm. So that's what G.I. Joe is. If you read a G.I. Joe file card, you have a primary specialty and a secondary specialty on most file cards. And your their background for a G.I. Joe really, I mean, how many of them are, are, are Marines? Uh, four or five? Uh, some of them are Air Force, very few. Some are Navy, a little bit more. But most, the majority, were Army anyway. So... Mm -hmm. Once they became a GI Joe, they were all, it was almost like their own military branch, and that's kind of the way I I I uh, guided the system that way. Yeah, and well, the Joe organization is meant to be somewhat, um, somewhat of a of a bunch of specialists, not rank and not necessarily rank and file soldiers. Well, this There's... is true. I mean, they have they have a rank and uh, they have a, a chain of command, but. Uh, certain Joes, based on specialty, can be put in charge over higher-ranking Joes because of the specialty. Mm -hmm. and that that's true in, in the uh, the Larry Hobby, uh, Larry, Larry Hama comic and the uh, Sunbow cartoon. Yeah. So it just depends on you know what source you're you're using, but in in any, in, in any case, the specialty usually trumps rank. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the other. There was there was an infantry role that Essence Twenty had, but the but the um the characters that the characters that they put in it um it's it's once again a, ca a case of I have some I have some questions because the examples that they ca that they gave for the infantry role were Bazooka, Gung Ho, Clutch, Wild Bill, and Doc. Yeah, none of those really fit that role. I mean, except for maybe Bazooka, but he still he would be, he'd be a heavy, uh, yeah, a heavy, heavy, uh, heavy weapons operator. And that that is inf infantry in a way, but it's it's more specialized than just basic infantry. Uh, so I went for a more generic approach, so that uh, a, any ref could take it and use any government or country. And base it on their military, mm -hmm. so I tried to go really generic. So they there is, there is uh, you know uh, special forces, which I you know I did call that a commando, uh, because that's inherent in the GI Joe universe. But I also used infantry, and then there, I I, we, I did pilot and driver, and I I really tried to focus on if somebody was looking at the GI Joe action figures, they could go, well, what would Clutch be? Well, he's a driver. What would Ace be? He's a pilot. Well, what's what's Duke? He's a field leader. So and there you get, there you are. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't really that hard once I started getting into it, and I think they overcomplicated it in, in some ways, and maybe I did too. But that's because I I put what I love into the system. But it depends on your point of view. Um, uh, I know that I know that some people heavily romanticize the ba the base four classes. From 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 oh, from like white box D and D, you know, warrior, thief, cl cl cleric, and wizard. But eventually, eventually, you're gonna run into the situation where there's a certain archetype or a certain concept that somebody wants to build their character around that just isn't going to fit. Since original originally, you ha you in the ver I'd say in the very early days, and you can check me on this if if need be. There was the idea of you roll your stats and then you bi and then you build a character around that. As time has gone on, the that's shifted towards you have a concept in mind and then you build and then you build the stats around that concept. 
that's yeah, that's true, and I, that's kind of how I do it. I, I, I set it up is that you, you basically, uh, you're your your game master or what we like to call a referee, because that's what uh, Gygax actually wanted to call dungeon masters, and he did throughout the original first edition DMG. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, 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 that's where gaming came from. But uh, I, I find myself being a referee more often than anything else when I run a game. So I, I like that term, and so I continue to use it. But uh, uh, when you're when you're looking at the a system as a whole for class and race, um, that doesn't really work in a not necessarily in a fantasy setting, or but definitely not in a military setting. Uh, if somebody wants to build a character as a ref, I ask them, well, what, what kind of character do you want to play? And then together we kind of I try to help them uh, guide them to build the character they want to play. So mm-hmm. I I don't the rolling stats and then making a character is it's fun if all you're doing is playing a basic game, but if you want to actually play a, a character you're going to role play, you want to be able to live with that character because you are going to play that character for a basic game. When you're just going in a dungeon and fighting monsters, that that works okay. But if you're actually going to role play your character, you want to create a character. I'm not going to say build because that's not necessarily the right term. But if you're you want to you want to create a character that you are going to be living with in the game, that you are that character, then you're going to want a character that you have done yourself and not the game system. And that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Of course, of course, when to- when talking about ca- when talking about getting into character, I don't want to imply that people have to be full on method actors because even most actors aren't method actors. Those, oh no, those are that ki- that kind of getting into character is a rare unicorn kind of kind of thing. Um, it, it, you should remember that it's a game first and foremost, <laughs> and my rule number one is have fun. Mm-hmm. So, but there was the. When it came to the core of when it came to the core essence twenty system, there was one particular thing that stru- that struck me as a very bizarre choice, and that is how it handles its core dice. Now, work with me on the work with me on this for a moment. If if you're you if one of your core dice is a d twenty, what sort of resolution would you would you assume is is used to get Say a critical or an automatic success, whichever you want to call it. Using a d twenty for combat, that no, would ju- be just rolling a period. A... Just the d twenty period, not combat or non combat. Uh, it, it well, it depends on what you're doing. If like, if you're asking, calling for an ability check, uh, your your ability score uh goes up, not down. So you're gonna want to roll under your ability score to succeed. Now. The way uh, most of these systems are set up, you got to roll close to your ability score. And, and that just is confusing to players, at, at least I've found. Yeah. So, and combat is always high. So they want you, they're, they're, in, they're ingraining it that you're supposed to roll high on a 20-sided. Now, that, it depends on what you're doing. And I, I, I agree with you. It just... Essence, uh, essence twenty. I wasn't. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent familiar with it because I, I got into it and went. Okay, this is a D20 system, so this isn't working for me. Well, here, and, here's the thing. It is and it isn't. This is where things right. get strange, because the idea is you roll a D20 plus a d- plus a varying polyhedral based on the based on the um, level of skill for whatever skill you're using. Um, going from D4 all the all the way to D12. Um, Savage Worlds does a sim- does a similar thing, but it does it with its attribute and skill and skills with a ru- with a rule of four in terms of the degree of success that you get. But what they decided to do was that criticals are when you get the ma- or when you get the highest potential die, which is you- from D6 to D12 for most characters. On the skill die, not on the d20, which ends up meaning that the hi- that the higher your skill is, the less likely you are to be able to get a crit, which well, that, is that, baffling. That's kind of silly. 
It is. Uh, well, I liken it to whatever combat die you use. A crit should be the highest number on the die, and a fumble should be the, the one every time. Unless you're aiming low, which, which is going to be the same principle, just reversed. Like in say, right. um, ba basic, where get where you want to aim low, or um, the or or the victory point system I've talked about with fading suns, where you're tr where you're trying. You're technically aiming low, but you're trying to get as close to the line as you can. Hence, why I call the S that partic the um, victory point system in Fading Suns D20 blackjack. You know, like how in blackjack you're trying to get as close to 21 as you can without going over. Yes. But in all of those setups, it's 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 very consistent. Uh, and I I remember when I reviewed. The Essence 20 system in my Power Rangers review, I had said that this is reinventing the wheel unnecessarily. There was no reason. Th there was no reason that I saw that it couldn't be. You get a natural 20, then you cr then you crit, or there's some extra effect, or what what have you. Um, I didn't see the reason why the skill the skill die had to be the be the determining factor. Most... Um, you know, it, it it really doesn't have to be. I mean, I I use a lot of the all, all the dice in my in my system. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it, yes, if you're if you're using a D twenty for just about everything, uh, then you should make it the same. Uh, you know, if 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 you're going for that, like your blackjack analogy, that I they that that's okay. But I what how does that factor in for other things you're trying to do in your game system? That's my question. Um, in the case of in the case of um, of Fading Suns and a, and a bunch of other games, there has been a, there has been a concept that I've nicknamed "All Roads Lead to Rome," where you have one particular you have one particular mechanic that is is the is the unifying re is the unifying resolution um, system. Like ev everything else is just different contexts for the, for that form of resolution, whether it be the um, success based d sixes that you see in say Shadowrun, or or that or that victory point system I mentioned before, or even the um, rule of four approach that Savage Worlds has. Um, when you're ro when you're rolling dice that. Um, you have that particular Rome that you're building off of. Okay. You know, in um, and I'm not real for, uh, I, I'm not a fan of the, you have to have a certain number of successes. Uh, that, I, that is, to me, it's unnecessarily complicated for the player. I, I prefer that they roll the one die and that die determines what, what happens based on yeah. how well they roll Based on what they're rolling for. Well, not not all of the not all of the examples I'm I'm giving do a certain number of successes. It's just for each of yeah, the I different games, there's that there's that degree of consistency. Like I said, all roads lead to Rome. Um, but but and even f even further, the other th the other thing that was kind that was kind of. Str that was kind of strange is, and you you probably had to deal with this too in regard to advancement in this kind of system because when you look at the when you look at the characters through any sort of any sort of Joe versed sto story, uh, they don't really upgrade the way fa the way um certain fantasy characters might upgrade. They're all they're already experts they're already spe they're already specialists they may side grade but those never stick around at least not at, at least in all but all but rare exception well i i, I really steered away from using levels in general uh, and if, if that's the way you know you're going to increase your character's abilities that's one thing i i believe in, in increasing the character as much as they the player wants to but they have to take their uh, experience points, or what I, I call in the military action game, specialty point pool. Mm -hmm. They can use that to buy other specialties, but they have to trade for it too. 
So it's, it's not something they can just do overnight. And, and uh, especially, uh, especially a G.I. Joe character, they are a trained soldier already. So when, they, when you start out, you've got a soldier who knows what they're doing. They're not necessarily experienced in the field uh, as much as, you know, it's, it's like they're not, a, they're not a basic character is what I'm trying to say. So where do you begin? That's, that's, that's the question. And the, what I was seeing in the Essence D20 uh, version of G.I. Joe from, from Renegade Studios was they took that kind of that aspect out of it. I mean, it, it's like, well, how do they, how does the character, I had too many questions is what I'm trying to say. How does the character progress in, in anything? I mean, I, I don't want a character just to be the same, but they have to start somewhere and there should be a progression, but it doesn't have to be, you know, that this major level up thing, you know, if you're understanding what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And well, mo most adv most advancements, whether it be comic books or otherwise, aren't that kind of granular. It's some it's something like a specific bit of equipment or or a specific weapon or a specific vehicle and that kind of thing. Right. Well, in those in the in these stories, you know, the comics or the cartoon, uh, they there's there's really no progression like that. I mean, yeah, they learn from their mistakes and their and their experiences, but if you in a you have to also look at it to in a role playing aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, if your character never uh, progresses in any way, then you're not. I don't know. It, it just seems like you're not role playing. Uh, a character should always progress in some manner. And I, I, I believe in uh, progression. Uh, it is a slow advancement, but not necessarily uh, levels. Uh, levels make absolutely no sense to me as far as a role playing. And, and characters don't talk in those terms or that context. So why should your players? Uh, yeah, either, like, like I said, there are increases and advancements. And that's kind of, I kind of do a skill based milestone combination system. Mm hmm. And, and I, I wasn't I wasn't seeing anything like that in the the uh, and I don't want to I don't want to I, I don't want to say that I don't I don't like the essence twenty, but it's just not for me. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I I mean I was a bit tongue in cheek with the meme that that people are going to see in this video, but a lot of that was due, was due to the due to the fact that. Bo that both games have had have had a degree have had a degree of backlash and the essence 20 system doesn't seem to be getting the same amount of um attention as as it possibly should because there's there's not been much in the way of pro of proper expansions there's not been much in the way of like fa like faction expansions the the last big expansion i remember hearing was this one book that w that was built for crossovers between the three properties, which I think raises more questions than it solves. Uh, I, I think that may have a lot to do with the success of the, or the basically the lack thereof success in the in the book sales and all the, the supplements that they put out for it, which hasn't been many. I'd say that, uh, and po and possibly um, Hasbro not exactly. Having having a lot of a hundred IQ moves lately. Well, there's that, and I don't I don't really see Hasbro actually backing the role playing game. I mean, they they said, oh yeah, you could use GI Joe, but it seems like Renegade Studios is all their own in that respect. They more they more or less have been, and. I think part I think part of it is the fact that Re Renegade themselves has been putting more attention in the in the recent the recent collaboration that they've done with Paradox when they took over for World of Darkness after all of the drama that happened with um, Onyx Path. A lot of that drama being very very stupid, over pe people overreacting to nothing burgers, but that's the way the cookie crumbled. 
that's kind of how it, it, it all is to me. It's all kind of nothing burgers. Um, I I just focus on on game play and and, and seeing to it that my players have a good time. Yeah. Um, and that can happen with just about any game system if you know, with a good ref. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you have a good game system, a, a decent ref, even a, even a a poor ref can take a good game system and do well with it. So yes, game mechanics is important, but you should also factor in that it, it, it needs to be a game and people need to be having fun. Mm-hmm. And it seems like they, they've steered away from that a little bit. I mean, Has, Hasbro in particular, uh, they've missed a lot of marketing opportunities. I mean, for a G.I. Joe role-playing game, they should have gone all in with with their the, the classified figures and the game system and made them compatible. And they, they missed that opportunity, I think. Because the... The character sheet doesn't uh, does not attempt to replicate the to replicate the file look. I think there might be some premium character sheets that do, but I don't have I don't have them. Uh, I'd be, uh, me either. I, they they sent me because uh, when you buy the book, you could get a digital copy of their record sheet for free, and that's what I I had already read most of the book, and when I saw the character sheet, I'm like, this is basically just Excuse me. This is basically just fifth edition D and D done differently. Well, about that, when I, when I covered the Power Rangers RPG, I did a little bit of digging on the staff. You know, because fortunately, with the way the way R, the way um, RPG Geek works, I can look up people's past work by just by just looking at what they contributed to. The majority of the right. people, the majority of the staffers that I found, they had mostly done adventures for D for D and D fifth edition, and to me that to me that was in that particular case. I'm like, if you're if you're going to bring these people in, maybe you would have been better off just doing fifth edition instead of playing yeah. half seas. I'm not going to say that a GI Joe fifth edition would have been better but it would have been something within the, within their particular wheelhouse yeah yeah i agree uh, or the uh, i and i will i will admit the other thing that's tr- that's tricky about this is it's a lot of a lot of people who are veterans when it comes to the hobby tend to forget where they come from and tend to Overlook the perspective of somebody coming in from outside, you know some, you know the newcomers, what have you. And that's a tricky thing when you're designing a game system. Yeah, you, yeah. You, it may make sense to you, but this is why we play test it. Does it make sense to players? Yeah, it would. It would be very easy. It would be very easy to say, well, this is clearly made for people who are already fans of GI Joe, but that's not really an assumption that should be made. Right, because not, I'm I'm pretty sure that even at your table, not everybody is the same level of expert when it comes to the Joeverse. Oh, not at all. Most of them aren't, but they're they're having fun. They like GI Joe, mm-hmm. and that's a lot. So uh, for a lot of them, that's that's their, their their basic knowledge of it. They like it. Yeah, uh, I'm, only a couple of them are really into GI Joe like I am. And but for the most part, they, they just want to play and enjoy a. G.I. Joe type game. Mm-hmm. And there's also the fact that there, that there's a certain through line that has to be established because even people who are into it may have come into it through different avenues. For some it may it may have been it may have been the original Sunbow cartoon. For some it may have it may have been the may have been the live action movies. I feel sorry for whoever is in that position, but I <laughs> but I digress. And for some for well, some it might it might have been though it might have been the it might have been through just the just the figures or through the various incarnations of the comics. So it's important. Well, to have I like that it all. Through line. I like I like all of it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just I'm a big GI Joe fan, but it was the comic book by Larry Hama that really sold me on everything. Yeah. And 
Um, it's important to have that to have that kind of through to have that kind of through line, so that so that people can get into something even even if they don't have that pr that previous knowledge. And something something else I do th I do think is just as important is a lot of obviously a lot of the toys had had more than their fair share of accessories and whether it be gadgetry whether it be vehicles what ha what have you because of the razor razor blade philosophy that that they were doing but within your system since this wasn't addressed in essence 20 have you get, have you put consideration into um si into systems to allow the gm to create specialized equipment vehicles what have you oh definitely uh, vehicles are a heart of GI Joe. It's 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 part of the it's part of the genre. Mm -hmm. uh, but I kind of I took it at, again a, a, a kind of a generic approach, and it it I found it a lot easier than I thought it would be to make them like uh, monsters from our fantasy system. Set it up the same way with the same type of stats and all and, and that sort of thing. So that the characters, it would be just like their character. They'd be familiar with it. They could get into the vehicle and use the vehicle, and and and, and use it just like they would their character. Mm -hmm. But they have to be, you know, they have to they have to have the specialty to know how to use the vehicle, just like in the in the you know regular GI Joes and the Jovers. Mm -hmm. Now, but yes, definitely, vehicles are a part of it. Now, given uh, given all of that. That brings me to the to the topic of um, vehicular combat because that's gonna be part of the fantasy. Whether it, whether it be whether it be people wanting to do dog fighting or do or do or do shooting while on, while on bikes, that particular vehicular combat is gonna be part of the identity. And a lot of games, and of course, Essence Twenty included, don't have not historically done the best job of do, of doing vehicular combat whether it be theater of the mind or on or on grid how do you address that kind of thing well you know i i not going to speak for the way they do it because like i said once i got into it i i decided i wanted to do my own but I address vehicle combat like any other combat. I mean, a, there in our fantasy game, we had aerial combat, we had water combat, we had ground combat. Uh, I why complicate it with a different system? It, I I kept the same system for vehicle combat that I do for basic combat. The only difference is you are using a different uh, a tool or a, for lack of a better term, a support character. So like a, a bonded bout or a familiar in a fantasy setting, it's the same thing. If you're going to use a motorcycle or a tank or a jet, how, mm -hmm. why should that be any different? Mm -hmm. that, that's what mm -hmm. I asked myself. And I went, okay, well, if that's what I'm going to do going into it, that's how I'm going to make it. So that the combat is the same. So that a player doesn't get all confused and going, oh, well, well, we're, we're in a 3D battle. Well, you always are in a 3D battle just because you're on the ground. Does it make it any less 3D? Something can come in from above you, or from the side, or from below even. So how how is that any different if you're in the air or in the water? So a, why change the combat system just because you've entered a vehicle? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you does your does your combat change just because you you got on a horse? No, no, it really doesn't. But are you skilled to use that horse? That's the question. So it would be the same in the military action game. Are you skilled to use that motorcycle or that tank or that jet? Mm -hmm. And I just kept it the same. Speaking of skills, that's one. That's one thing that I've always that I've always had a mixed relationship with because I've seen plenty of games go a little bit too far, especially especially a good chunk of games that came out in the nineties went way too far in terms of the number and granularity of individual skills. And um, given given the approach that you're going with, I'm guessing that you've tried to make sure that there, there's a good variety of skills, but it doesn't go overboard? Uh, 
I tried not to go overboard at all. Now, a, a referee can add what they want to the system, but I just I stuck to the basics. And I went and I, I took every specialty on every file card, and I, that's what I used. Because mm -hmm. I, I, remember, I, remember, I remember in some cases where I'm not going to name names, but there was a game that that had um, different sk different skills for each su each subtype of say firearms. So a, sk a skill for SMGs, a skill for heavy machine guns, a skill for pistols, a skill for assault rifles. The pro the problem that ends up happening with that is that's not how people tend to take combat training, even even if that training isn't official. Somebody who's good with assault rifles isn't suddenly going to be a scrub with pistols. Well, this is true. Um, anybody with basic military military training should know how to use, like, say, a pistol or a rifle or a combat knife. Mm -hmm. so I kind of focused on it. Yes, I do have a different specialty for those things, but it just gives them bonuses in the in combat. Uh, they can't. It, it's not that they can't use something just because they don't have a specialty in it. It's just that if they have a specialty, then they get bonuses. Yeah, a lot, and that's the other thing. A lot of games will penalize if you're using a skill unskilled, and it sounds like in your case, you're going with the opposite. You're not penalized for using a using a skill you don't have um, points in. You're just not getting a bonus. Right. Yeah. They, why should they? They're they're a trained soldier. If they pick up a rifle that they're not familiar with, that doesn't mean they can't fire it and use it because they, they, they're probably familiar with a different type of rifle. But I kept the I kept that kind of stuff very generic too, as far as the weapons are concerned. And I just have like a machine gun and a pistol and and, and you can call them what you want. I I gave them numerical uh uh, connotations so that it was just simpler and then a basic set of damage and we're still we're still hashing out what those damages are mm -hmm. and what a vehicle actually does add to your character uh, but your character basically gets in the vehicle and it's their skill that they're still using to fire a weapon uh, you know a, a vehicle like I was I was realizing uh, when I ran the session two last night that the vehicle, I didn't have anything set up to have the vehicle give them any bonuses. But then I realized that the, they, they wouldn't get a bonus unless they turned on the targeting computer, which I already had in the system. So I'm going to encourage them to use targeting computers and things like that to add to it. Mm -hmm. Just give them another bonus. So every, everything basically for me is a, a bonus when they add it to it. And they add their total bonus to their combat die roll. And that's uh, their the, what we call a defensive rating of the target. Mm -hmm. And if they hit the defensive rating, then they score a hit and they roll damage. It, it's that it really to me combat should be that simple. And speaking of, speaking of damage, some get some games will ha will have a have a more universal affair, whether it be hit points or life points or whatever. It, they're call whatever they're calling it. Some will do wounds that do escalating penalties. You know, to re to reference how you shouldn't be doing combat heavy in the in those particular games, and some will do more location based affairs. Where do you fit into that spectrum? Are you doing um, a hit points like affair? Are you doing wounds? Where where do you fit into it? Well, I I basically we use hit points, but. The wounds will factor into it if because uh, there's no in a military actually there's no healing per se. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they if they get patched up like if a medic patches them up, they get a certain amount of hit points back. Uh, hit points are just a game mechanic. Uh, you, you you basically as a as a game master you need to describe how they're taking damage and how they're hurt. And if they reach zero hit points, you know, they die. You know, that's just part of the game. But I also have, a, a, I like a death store mechanic. So they, there's a there's a window of where they can be, they can recover and, and, and be saved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but at that point, if they get beyond that window, then their character is dead and that's it. Yeah. 
but it's a it's a game. And if you if your character dies, you roll up another one, and that's always been the concept of, of a role playing game. Mm-hmm. I don't see why it should be any more complicated than that. If you if you start getting into, I I mean we I do have a hit location chart and all that. It that just it, it slows the game down a lot when you start doing that. Uh, yes, and if uh, the players could go, all right, I want to target a specific spot on a body, then they would have a penalty, you know, and that's it. It just modifies their die roll. Yeah. I don't know why it has to be more complicated than that, but that's what I'm comfortable with running. If somebody else is comfortable with running a D20 system, why? Why? I don't have a problem with that. I, I think yeah. everybody should play the way they want to play. So when it comes to your core mechanic, is it is it a case of... D- using d20 and and roll high or or roll low um well for combat actually uh different uh different mos uh military operating operational specialties have different combat dies uh, all the way from d6 up to d20 uh so whatever the combat die is it really doesn't matter they, they roll a one they fumble if they roll the highest number of the die that could be a potential crit uh, and so as far as hit points are concerned, uh, damage just factors in uh, normally, you know, w- within that scope of, of a hit and miss. Mm-hmm. So, but is, yeah, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. Is it a, is it a case where diff- where different types of die are used, or is is it a case that no ma- no matter what the MOS, you're still using a D twenty? Oh no no! I, I I very we very rarely use the actual D twenty for combat. Uh, the uh, the armed forces the the members just that's their uh, faction. Mm-hmm. They actually have a D twelve, and I, we use a lot more D twelves for combat than anything else. Uh, D twenty I really use for making ability score checks, which is which is a minor uh, skill check, or if if you have to have a major check, we have uh, what we call feats. Which is completely different from a, uh, you know, a standard games feats, but that just means they're they're uh, it's a major check and they roll percentiles. If it's more difficult and if it's a, if it's a just a basic minor check, then it's a d20, and it's mm-hmm. their ability score or less. I don't know. I, I I try to keep things very simple for the players, except for when they're making characters. That could get a little complicated. Because I I like I like options for my players. Yeah. Now, one of the other th- one of the other things that I think is just as important is is the concept of of being at the being at a given base, whether that base is on a sh- on a ship, a for a forward operating base, or anything like that. And I'm I'm guessing since since a lot of what's in military action game was carried over from Len Harrow. Did you carry over some sort of hold holding system? Um, I actually don't have one in the Len Harrow Fantasy Adventures, but uh, I have incorporated a a uh, uh, base of operations in the military action game, yes, because that's kind of core to the G.I. Joe-verse. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always yeah. have a pit of some sort, or, or the rock, or G.I. Joe headquarters. Or yep. and a cobra always has a, a temple or a, a hidden base. There, there, there. That needed to be in there. So yes, mm-hmm. I, I do use a, a area of operations. Yeah. Um, and and then they they take one. If you know, like, uh, our, well, currently they have a vehicle called the Mako, which is basically an APC. Mm-hmm. That they 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 that's their whole base when they're in the field, and then they go back to their uh, their their uh, their base that that's been set up for them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if you had devised some souped-up version of an IFV to act as a mobile base. <laughs> well, you would be right. <laughs> Their base is actually a uh, a very shield-esque her- helicarrier. So hopefully, it, it la- also- hopefully it lasts longer than the than the helicarrier, which always crashes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I haven't. Just- Did I lose you? Yeah, 
Yeah, I had. I brought I brought up the IFV thing because there's so, with with some of the with some of the experimental things that go, that go in and out of diff, different militaries. There's there's way too much potential to to um to not explore to not explore, and that includes the concept of taking an IFV and putting a little bit further of a spin on it. Yeah, but I, I'm kind of keeping it simple. And the uh, their, their their base was actually uh, out of operation and grounded as they first started, mm -hmm. and it's it, it's been being under repair by their uh, the AI and its re and its re repair drones. So I, I try to keep it as grounded as possible, and it it and that would take one hell of a power source to actually make something like that fly. So that's not something they're going to be using on every every mission. Well, like the USS Flag in GI Joe, uh, you know, it was it was it was in the ocean. Yeah, they could use it, but what good was it on every mission? Yeah, that would be a bit. That would be a bit excessive. Exactly. That's and... something you pull in. You you bring in as as a method of bringing your uh, characters out of the fire. Yeah. Now. Given the popularity of of a character like Snake Eyes, who I specifically bring up in this instance because he because of how different he is from from everybody else, which I think is I think is part of the appeal. Um, right. I mean, yeah, there's the whole ninja craze of the of the '80s, but I feel I feel like saying that's saying that's why he became popular is kind of uh, is kind of missing the point. <laughs> but I'm... There was so much more to him than just Ninja. I mean, he started out as a commando. Uh, him being mute made, made his character that much more interesting. It's amazing how a character that cannot speak became the prime character of that series. <laughs> I'd say because of the because of the fact that again, there's there's nobody there was nobody else like him, both both vis both visually and. I was going to say audio, but again, mute. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's I know. It's true. Some of the, some of the later cartoons would get around that by having some by having somebody who could speak for him, but for the for the most part, he for the most part he doesn't talk. And the, but there's but people who know what they're doing can still make him very expressive. Um, right. Even even if it even if it involves comedy, like have like say. I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the special, but there was one CG special that involved the mess hall cooking, cooking with um, grenades. <laughs> yes, uh, that would be uh, uh, Spy Troops, the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is it's one of those little things that just that ends up making me laugh more than it should. But ah, exactly, has you'll never, has, you'll never, you know, has a slight little aftertaste of white phosphorus, but other than that. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've had get, I've had running gags of people of people cooking barbecue using using um, alchemist fires, but <laughs> <laughs> and and some and some cultures enjoy enjoy having their enjoy having it while it's still on fire because they view it as some rite of passage. And if that sounds stupid, well, that's because it was meant to be stupid. <laughs> But it's no it's no less stupid than some of the insane spices people put on modern day food. But this is, has this is very and, true. Has anyone approached the table and said that they wanted to do a XP of, of that ninja archetype? Not yet. Uh, I, I I have the possibility of the game system, mm -hmm. and what really uh, turned me away from uh, you know the the essence twenty uh, GI Joe. Was that you couldn't actually be the GI Joes. You had to make your own character. Now, I, I've set the system up so you create your own character, but you could also create a GI Joe from the uh, from the the, the existing Joe verse. Uh, and I, and if I had the rights to GI Joe or the uh, contract to do it, uh, that would be cool. And I would actually set up a book where uh, they I would have a 
a roster basically of Joes that they you know they can play and keep adding to it. And that's what I'm saying. That's where mm-hmm. that's where I think Hasbro really missed the boat. Uh, they could have had, they had just doubled their action figure sales and the game sales easily by just saying, "Well, use this file card, and that's the character card for the game." I so you know, I remember I remember I remember a long I remember a long time ago. Um, Marvel was ri- this. I think this was back in the '90s. Marvel was really pushing this power grid system with all of their characters. Like ha- like having a specific stat block on the on the back of merchandise, even making the overpower card game out of it, and trying to implement that with the diceless Marvel Universe RPG, which was kind of the redheaded stepchild because they thought they could compete with the recently released D and D third edition, which that was never going to happen. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, even. Regardless of regardless of our own opinions on third edition, they were trying. They had put, Marvel Universe had come out in in the very early two thousands, and third edition was the first D and D thing to officially be out in um in um set. I want in at least five years. So of course, of course, people were gonna people were gonna flock to. The um, pro- the prodigal son returning, as it were. Right. Well, you know, I know a lot of people who love playing third edition. And oh, it, I, it wasn't. Yeah. I thought it was a bad system. It just to me wasn't D and D anymore. But, Plus, it changed everything I had. But uh, I'm, I don't want to get into an edition wars th- thing. That's just that's just oh, a, no, bit, a, a no. bit of timing thing, and I find edition wars cringe. But the. I want I wanted to bring yeah, the I power <laughs> I wanted to bring the power grid thing because that kind of ties into what you're talking about of having that degree of unification. And the power grid thing was done was done for several years, so it's not like it's impossible to do. No. There's oh and there's also the f- the fact that there's a bit of unification when it comes to the stats for the BattleTech War Game and the RPG, which I have my issues with how Mech Warrior and A Time of War and Destiny handle the RPG end of things, but attempting that kind of unification, there is a certain appeal in that. Yeah, yeah. And it hasn't been done successfully yet. I don't think. In term, in terms of, G- in terms of G. Now, in terms of um, BattleTech, well, th- they've been doing that approach for de- for decades now. Um, everything still, whether you're doing the war game or the role playing game, everything revolves around doing a roll high two d six. Um, and in the ca- in the case of the in the case of um, the power grid, the only reason I think the Marvel the thing that kept the Marvel Universe RPG from being able to flourish. I would honestly say it was because they did a diceless system, and those are gonna be a harder sell no matter what. Players like to roll dice. <laughs> yeah, we, we're all we're all a bit we all have a bit of dice goblin in us, and anyone who says <laughs> otherwise is wrong. And I, I don't have anything against diceless systems. It's just, it's so, gonna it's gonna be a harder sell. And I I have to say the Marvel Saga rules for, uh, for with using cards. I don't count that work. as diceless. But you don't count that as diceless, okay? <laughs> when I say diceless, I mean no randomizer, period. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. The kids, the cards made it random. Mm-hmm. Because I've t- I haven't reviewed the Marvel Saga specifically, but I have reviewed another game that used the so- the Saga system. That being yeah, I Dragon that Last Vintage. Yeah, I extensively. I, I, I enjoy the Marvel Saga. I, I enjoy the original Marvel uh, role play game too. Um, I like more. I like Marvel Phase Rip. Um, I yeah, that's what do... that, that's, it's based on the original. Yeah. Though the the funny thing the funny thing about that is the original version, like the original original version when it was just called Marvel Superheroes, didn't have right. character creation. It just operated on the assumption that you'd just want to play as characters from Marvel comics. 
a mistake that's that pretty they... much what people were looking for. Yeah, so they 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 had they they had that kind of right. Uh, they, but with the saga rules, they made it so you could make your own characters. I well, thought that they eventually cool. did make character creation in the advanced rules right. for Phase Rip. I think be, I think because they had gotten such a thrashing with the um, Indiana Jones game that TSR had put out, where there was yeah. no character creation and you were just playing as the cast from the movies. Yeah. Which I do I do think that it's best to have both. To have the have the established characters statted out so you can get kind of a baseline for them. And so, yeah, I would I would have loved to own. have that added to my my, my game, but uh, you know <laughs> but I, I have no I have no copyright wise, I couldn't do it. But I'm guess would it be fair of me to say that you do plan on putting a few sa- sample data files for um, like iconic and iconic NPCs and the like. I would like to. It, it just depends on on where, if the game takes off, and if I can. I I would actually like it to be a licensed thing through Hasbro if I could, because I would do it. I would license it with them, and actually, uh, I would make a whole roster book that you could play. Yeah, I would do it. Oh, but a, a, as it stands, I have to make it generic. Yeah, I'm. I'm just, and I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying utilize some legally distinct version of version of Duke Road Roadblock and all, and all of that. But just um, say iconic representatives of of various um archetypes that a GM could plug in. Yeah, yeah. It it could very easily be done with what I have already set up. I I definitely could do that. Like I could put like a, a first sergeant character, a a commando character, you know, base like that. I could, yeah, I definitely could set that up. I mm-hmm. haven't as of yet, but as I said, they we're still definitely up, uh, definitely play testing the whole, the system. Yeah. So, um, were there any things while play testing that you had thought had thought would had thought would work on paper, but in pre- in practice didn't as well as that you had, as well as you had thought. And I, not that I can think of off the top of my head, but like I said, I I, I really just cloned it from La Lahara Fantasy Adventures, in which we had play tests for uh, probably a good three decades now. So mm-hmm. uh, we had the bugs out of that system, so it was really kind of easy to transfer that over to a military action game, but. Uh, what made what was difficult about military action game was making it match the genre and, and genre when you do a genre specific thing, it's important to keep those those uh, keep the feel of that, and then that's the only that's the only issue I ran into not not anything necessarily I put to paper no. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, do you? I know that I know that Mag is is still in active playtesting, but do you have any do you have any plans to release a an open playtest document in the next few months? Um, I I was actually hoping to release something by either next summer or next fall. So, mm-hmm. and probably through Drive Through RPG. That way, if we make any changes, it automatically uploads to whoever's already uh, picked it up. Mm-hmm. I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. that now, what I wasn't expecting the full book to be to be out by then, but at the very least, well, like I, I don't like, I don't like to half-ass anything. So mm-hmm. if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I will, I will certainly keep an eye out on the on the development of that, but. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Well, I appreciate you having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, 
On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>